Like every hero, he had obstacles to overcome. And they said, there's no way this will sell. But the rewards were great. If they didn't have Mega Man, I don't even know how they'd be surviving today, honestly. Learn the secrets behind his power. It's about one thing. And it's always about one thing, blasting. It's a huge cast of characters that any kid can enjoy. Everybody loves Mega Man. And meet Inafune, the man behind the Mega. I had no idea my luck would go this well, that this character would be this great and last this long. So yes, it was a huge surprise for me. In 1984, a Japanese video game company named Capcom hits its stride in the arcade scene with popular hits including 1942 and Gunsmoke. Their success allows them to expand, and a young artist named Keiji Inafune is hired. I've always liked drawing pictures. From a long time ago, I've always wanted to be an illustrator. Just about at the time that I'd graduated, video gaming companies were becoming very popular, and they had always wanted young, talented artists. And it was a good chance for me to break out, get into a company, and prove myself. So it just happened to be the right timing for me to be an illustrator. Inafune goes to work on Capcom's newest arcade game. The very, very first project I ever did was an arcade game called The Street Fighter. Then after that, when we were doing the project, they said, we're working on a new title for the home consumer division, and we'd like you to participate in that. So uh, it was at that time I joined the Mega Man project and the hunt for the hero turns personal. A lot of the uh, character design from Mega Man is based upon some of the Japanese cartoons that I saw when I was a child. I've always liked the images and the art, and when I was making this game, it was kind of like a going back to my roots, going back to my childhood when I designed it. It was very fun to design that character. And that character needs a name. Before it was Rockman, it was originally going to be Mighty Kid, or Knuckle Kid, and this is how we were doing the package, until so we decided on Rockman. And in the end, it did become, in the States, Mega Man. Actually, it's not a rock like a stone or a pebble. That was not where the name Rockman comes from. It comes from rock and roll. There's also another character named Roll. When I first designed the character, I had rock and roll in mind. That was the back image I was going off of when I designed a lot of the artwork. For me, Rock Man or Mega Man has always been a game that's been designed with music in mind. Music's always been a very important part of the series. And just like Mega Man, even his creators show weakness. This is Mega Man 1, all the original bosses that I drew with my own two hands. <laughs> when I look at it now, I think, man, I really wasn't that good, was I? If one of my character designers that work underneath me now were to bring something like this to me, I'd probably take one look and say, no way, this sucks, try again. <laughs> With the characters and story in place, it's time to rock and roll. Basically, when you think about it, there's not something in the world that is just stronger than everybody else. Almost everything has something it's stronger than and something that it's weaker to. Sort of like in scissors, rock, and paper. Scissors will beat paper, but it loses to the rock. Paper will beat the rock, but it loses to the scissors. So that's how the Mega Man weapons work. And now it's time to introduce the twist. Well, the whole idea behind Mega Man was you defeat one boss. And then you go to the next boss by using the weapon you just gained. They also give players a new kind of freedom. The original Mega Man game was interesting because it was one of the first games that allowed you to choose what level you played first. It was a linear platform game like a lot of other platform games, but you had a lot of freedom up front to choose the path that you wanted to take through the game. With Mega Man, they were giving the player something to, to look forward to, an element of strategy, which most games back then really didn't have. Once the game is finished, Inafune has to face his own bosses. After we got the game done, we took it over to sales. 
and we said, look, we got the game done, this is what it's like, and they said, there's no way this will sell. So I was really disappointed, of course. I was like, well, I tried my best, my hardest, really, really worked hard at it, and it didn't work out. Capcom decides to release the game in Japan in a limited amount. Surprising everyone, the game catches on in Japan. Capcom decides to bring the little robot to America. Before they cross cultures, they make a few changes. And like they say, it's what's on the inside that really counts. So it had some of the worst box art in the history of video games. It doesn't look anything near the uh, Mega Man that we see today. The box art for the first Mega Man game in the US was done very quickly. The president of Capcom US said to his marketing guy, you know, we need a cover done tomorrow. And he went out and got a friend of his to do it in like six hours. And that's the reason why it turned out so bad. They had some 45-year-old guy with a strange-looking weapon. Despite the cover, word begins to spread. And sales of Mega Man begin to gain momentum. The first Mega Man was indeed a sleeper hit. Word of mouth really caught on with the Mega Man. The Mega Man team begins to work on the sequel, but this time with a little extra help. Character Bushu. This was an illustration used in a poster which said, we are waiting for everyone's ideas for new enemies. There was a contest in Nintendo Power where kids could create robot monsters for the game. From 2, we had children participating in the R&D of the game. So you really have the game kind of created by children for children. You have that child touch, actually. When the sequel arrives in America in 1989, there's already a captive audience ready to face the evil Dr. Wily. If I were to have to throw out one single Mega Man title that I really liked, I guess it would be Mega Man 2. It was probably the one game where I really, really felt that I had put in 100% of everything that I was aiming for. Out of all the games I've made, one of the best ones. I really liked it. Capcom, realizing the potential of the game, throws their weight behind the series. When we made the first Mega Man, you're always limited by memory, how much space you have on the cartridges. And we had tons of characters that we had created that we all wanted to fit in the first game that we couldn't. So all the characters that were left over, we decided to put in number two. A lot of the characters became a lot more bright and colorful. The sprites were a lot prettier in the second one. We were able to do a lot of things that uh, we couldn't do in the first one. The game is popular, selling more copies than the original and ensuring that the Blue Bomber will return. Mega Man and Street Fighter came out around the same time, are responsible for, you know, Capcom. They branded Capcom, they made them a company to be reckoned with. People didn't really know Capcom as a brand until, you know, Mega Man came shooting it. With the success of two Mega Man games, Capcom rushes to release number three. When Mega Man 1 and 2 and 3 hit, it was huge. I mean, they kept coming out in progression. Like, it was, you know, one after the other after the other. They, they kept coming in and waste any time. They might not have known they had a hit on their hands, but once they did, it was immediate. Mega Man is on a roll, but Capcom's next move will be a frustrating one. In 1991, Nintendo releases the Super Nintendo, an updated version of their aging console system, with the arrival of better graphics and sounds. Classic 8-bit games are given new life in a 16-bit world, but one character is nowhere to be seen. I think they continued to do Mega Man games for the NES because, uh, first of all, it was easy to do. It was inexpensive for them to develop additional Mega Man games. All six of the Mega Man games for the NES use the same character animation. They have different music, different backgrounds, different enemies, different things to do, but it's basically the same engine. They got it right the first time and they just continued to do it. They didn't want to mess with the formula. Capcom's famous for not messing with a good thing. And at the time, Mega Man 2 had done outrageous numbers and 3 did fairly well. And they figured, you know, why mess with a good thing? Yeah, like maybe the decision seems a little weird now. But at the time, you know, the installed base of the Nintendo was, was outrageous, it was huge. So why wouldn't you want to release a new Nintendo game with, you know, your all-star Mega Man? Mega Man 4 blasts its way onto shelves in 1991. However, many people are beginning to move on to the newer system, leading the Blue Bomber with a shrinking fan base. Mega Man 5 is released in 1992. And Mega Man 6 hits the shelves a year later with little fanfare. The future looks bleak for the little robot. But in true video game style, he's about to get another life. 
By 1994, Capcom has quite a bit of experience making games for the Super Nintendo. They know that they will have to do more than just re-release older games on the new system. Mega Man needs a makeover. I, I guess with every system you have to have some sort of major evolution because graphically you can do so much more. And uh, the cool thing about Mega Man is he didn't go into 3D because you couldn't really quite yet. So, so instead of what Capcom did was just give him a makeover and make him Mega Man X. Using elements of the original series, Capcom's designers add new moves. And new characters to give gamers a different experience. Yeah, the Mega Man X series was very different from the originals. It still had the same type of gameplay. The character was similar, but it took place in a different time frame. The Mega Man X games are harder. I tend to not like the Mega Man X series, mainly because it's really hard. I feel like breaking my controller when I play them. They're much more serious in tone. The boss characters in the original Mega Man games are a little more comical and lighthearted and more colorful. The Mega Man X characters are hard and metallic, and the games are, some of those games are brutally difficult. Yet the game finds its fans. So it was this really cool techno quality to Mega Man. It was really neat. Like all the bosses were a lot more extravagant. All the sprites were a lot more colorful. Instead of the basic flame man, you had like mantises and, and peacocks and all these really extravagant creatures and bosses that, that you really didn't expect in a Mega Man universe. But when they make a flamingo robotic, it's cool for some reason. Dr. Wily knew what he was doing. Mega Man X arrives in stores in 1994. And Mega Man fans take notice. Mega Man's popularity is on the rise, and Capcom releases two games only a few months apart, Mega Man X2 and Mega Man 7. For the first time, Capcom allows two separate series to continue simultaneously, both the X series and the classic series. It got to a point where there was just a new Mega Man game coming out practically every year. I don't know if everybody was on top of that and was just continuing to buy all the Mega Man games, but the fact that there was a steady stream of games with that character in it, you know, really guaranteed that he would continue to be successful even when the newer system started to come out. Mega Man X3 arrives in stores less than a year later, but once again, the video game landscape is changing, and Mega Man will soon find himself homeless. By 1997, Nintendo has retired their Super Nintendo, and Sony's PlayStation is sending shockwaves through the industry. But Sony isn't exactly embracing Mega Man with open arms. I don't know if Sony's ever spoken about this policy on the record, but uh, it's pretty well known that in the early days of the PlayStation, they really wanted to differentiate the PlayStation hardware from everything else that had come before it. And what that meant in a nutshell was 3D games as opposed to 2D games, which is what the Super NES and the Genesis were really known for. Sony does not like 2D games. That is very important to understand uh, from their original standpoint on the PlayStation. It was important for Capcom to continue its formula of what worked, and 2D was what worked for them. So they originally did not want to do much for PlayStation because Sony did not want them to do anything for them. When Capcom approached them with Mega Man for the PlayStation in the US, and Sony shot them down. Capcom still moves ahead, and to mark the 10th anniversary of the Blue Bomber, they decide to release Mega Man 8, an update for the classic series, for the Sega Saturn. Ready. Fearing the competition, Sony also agrees to release the game. But they have a condition. And Sony insisted that the PlayStation version of Mega Man 8 have something different, special, additional, that the Saturn version didn't have. They ended up including a commemorative booklet that showed all the different boss characters from various Mega Man games, just so that Sony could say, hey, the PlayStation version's got something the Saturn version doesn't have. Mega Man finally arrives on Sony's new console, but his next jump will be an unexpected one. In 1998, Capcom follows up Mega Man's arrival on the PlayStation by agreeing to Sony's demand for a new look at the little robot. Wait a second.
second. Where are you going, Mega Man? That's not the right way. But the overhaul will take some work. The Mega Man series is originally a 2D game, and uh, trying to transform that 2D game into a 3D world. How would Mega Man look as he's jumping in a 3D world? How would he look as he's firing, running, all in this 3D world? So many different animations and movements you have to think about that uh, aren't considered in 2D because they don't exist. Well, I was going to have to say there's one particular trait about the uh, Mega Man Legends series that really stands out. It would have to be that you're on an adventure. I'm okay, well, everything's all right here. Trying to put Rockman in this new 3D world and have him interact uh, with everything in a believable fashion and still have all the fans think, yes, that is in fact the Mega Man that I'm used to uh, playing as. Trying to keep that image was very difficult. It's a game that utilizes 3D, a really uh, free world where you can go and do anything you really want to. It's not very linear. And with this adventurous world inside the Mega Man Legends series, we figured that there's a lot of different kinds of action, not just destroying an enemy or defeating an enemy. Other kinds of action are just, for example, walking down the road and maybe you kick a can or you shoot down a tree or something like that. So that alone gave it a lot of freedom and made it a lot more of a huge, whole new world an adventure. I think that's what really makes the Legends series stand out. Mega Man Legends is definitely, the, I would say it's the most underrated Mega Man game. I mean, it took Mega Man kicking and screaming into 3D gaming. Unfortunately, many don't agree. The graphics were not state-of-the-art, but they were decent at the time, and still Mega Man fans picked up on it. It didn't sell as well as the 2D games, but it was something that at least made Sony happy. It was 3D on their platform. Boy, that new engine sure is something. Completely different from the old one. <laughs> Following the leap into the third dimension, Capcom begins to look for other video game genres for their star to explore. First, Capcom sets their sights on the popular world of strategy gaming with the Mega Man Battle Network series. Uh, actually, there was two things that were kind of problematic about Battle Network number one. First of all, there was never a game of its type before. There was no pattern to follow, uh, no rough idea to, to go upon. Uh, if there was any type game, it was never really successful. They had all failed. So to blend an action game, along with the kind of fun you get from the Pokemon games. Or a Yu-Gi-Oh card game or something like that. To blend those two elements together, just the right amount of balance to make the game fun, yet new and fresh, that was very difficult. The combat system in the Mega Man Battle Network games is very different from what you see in a traditional Mega Man game. It's really an interesting variation from the type of gameplay that Mega Man is known for. But Capcom returns to the classic Mega Man style with the release of Mega Man Zero. Going back to that style of gameplay, it's a lot easier to understand what you have to do when you go into a game like that cold and you just pick up the controller for the first time. You run to the right and you beat guys up. You shoot, you jump on platforms. People are comfortable with that. In 2003, Capcom celebrates the 15th anniversary of its beloved character and releases updates to all three of its ongoing Mega Man series. Mega Man X7. Mega Man Network Transmission. And Mega Man Zero Two. After 15 years as one of the most revered game characters, he shows no signs of slowing. But Mega Man is Capcom's biggest selling game series of all time. After Mega Man is a very appealing character. 
He's got just the right amount of zip and power. There are so many different Mega Mans that you're always going to find one that appeals to you. Mega Man's still around today is because he's one of the staples of gaming history. They're going to keep making them damn things until he dies. <laughs> I don't know. He is what they live on still. There are so many games and so many fans of Mega Man that he's never going to die. I'm sure they're going to continue to do a lot more and a lot better Mega Man games. He's here to stay. I've been making Mega Man for about 15, 16 years now. It's a long time, but I still haven't had enough of him. He's a great character. I've always loved him, and I want to continue to keep making games with him in it. There's no reason to stop if you've got something good on your hands. As you can see, I have a lot of different uh, sketchbooks here, and this isn't all of them. There's a lot of enemy characters that have gone unused. But the ideas do keep coming. So many books, so little time. <laughs> the person who probably taught me the most in the gaming industry about what it's like to make a game would probably have to be the Blue Bomber himself, Mega Man. He really is a large part of my life. <laughs>